we're going to be talking about things this week that some of you may not have um, talked about in the past. In fact, for some of you, depending upon your age, this could be the first time that you are going to hear these matters. And the matters we're going to talk about are of a mature outlook. We're going to talk about how the world is moving further and further away from God. And we're going to have to be very specific in what we talk about, because these are the challenges that young people today, like yourselves, are facing living in a world and going to public schools, like most of you probably do, in a, in a world that is moving ever further away from God. So I would ask that the, especially the older ones and the audience to help the younger ones. And we're not looking for any laughing. We're not looking for uh, any smirking. What we're going to look at is what God calls righteousness and what he calls wickedness. And uh, to do that, we have to be very specific. I use language today that I didn't use 15 or 20 years ago because it wouldn't have been acceptable. But, but because of the degradation of society and, and where things are going, we now need to be able to recognize exactly what it is that we need to, uh, we need to stay away from. The, um, the picture of Bible prophecy We'll spend the rest of this week, after this slide, talking about the moral conditions. But I thought we'd start out for the first five minutes and just look at the political conditions. There are ten events that you would never expect to happen if you were just watching man's history unfold. For instance, we call them extremely unusual events. Number one, you would never expect a nation to go away for 2,000 years and then come back into existence. Very unusual, but that's what the Bible said would happen, that Israel would come back into existence at the time of the end, and lo and behold, that happened in 1948. A second very unusual event, that Jerusalem used to be under control of the Jews back until AD 70, and at the time of the end, the Bible says, look for Jerusalem to be under the control of the Jews again. You would never expect that to happen if the Bible didn't tell you to look for it. And it happened in 1967. Number three, the Bible says, look for democracy to become the people's expectation. Now, how many of you have had world history already in school? So in the Middle Ages, what was the typical government uh, system that was used in Europe? That's right, kings and monarchies. So whoever the king was, he was a king because he was born into that, or the queen. And it passed from generation to generation, king and queen. The Bible says at the time of the end, you watch, democracy will become the expectation of nearly all the nations. And it relates to a prophecy in Revelation 16 that talks about frog-like spirits coming out of the French Revolution that we'll look at uh, a little later in today's class. Number four, you would never expect Christians to reject Jesus when he returns to the earth, would you? Well, wouldn't, they, you wouldn't, wouldn't you think the Christians would be the very people who would be willing to accept Jesus when he comes back to the earth. But the Bible says, no, you watch. You watch, Psalm 2. Christians will actually reject Jesus when he returns to the earth. A very unusual circumstance. Number four, or sorry, number five, look for the nations of Europe to willingly give up their authority and their power. Their sovereignty is what it's called. And they will give that power to a central government, and the central government will then govern all of the European nations. Very unusual for a nation to give up its sovereign authority to another entity, so to speak. It's not unusual for one country to conquer another country and say, I'm taking over. But it's very unusual for countries to willingly give up their sovereign power to a central government. But Revelation 17 said, you watch, the very end days, 
The nations of Europe will willingly give up their sovereign power and they will all come together as a single political entity. There's only one other time I can think of when 13 independent, individual sovereign powers decided to join together in a single entity, a single government. Does anybody know when that happened? When the United States was established. The 13 colonies agreed, the individual states, we will give up our authority and we will now be governed by a single government in Washington. But the Bible says you watch, it's going to happen throughout Europe. Number six, homosexuality to become a celebrated lifestyle. You would never ever expect homosexuality to become a celebrated and a promoted lifestyle. It has never been accepted for generations upon generations in any culture. But the Bible says you watch at the time of the end, just before Jesus returns, homosexuality will become a celebrated lifestyle and there will be an explosion of evil, like in the days of Noah and Lot. Number seven, Russia, Germany, and France will become allies. Never in Europe's history have Russia, France, and Germany been allied. They've tried to conquer each other, so who tried to conquer Europe back in the late 1700s? His name starts with an N, and he stood about this high. Who was it? Sorry? Napoleon, that's right. Not the ice cream, but the general, that's correct. Napoleon, yeah. Napoleon was the French general who tried to conquer Europe, and he almost did, but he was not successful. What was your first name, by the way? Caitlin, okay, thanks very much, Caitlin. Who tried to conquer Europe in the 1900s? Yeah. Germany, under what leader? Somebody over here. They're, they're answering all the questions. Like, to, we, we need to get some more answers out of this group right here. Who tried to conquer Europe in the early 1900s, mid-1900s? Adolf Hitler. Was he successful? Almost, but he wasn't. The Bible says you watch in the last days, Russia, France, and Germany will form a single alliance. They're going to invade Israel. So the Bible says you watch, very unusual for Russia, France, and Germany, they have never, ever been aligned in the history of European politics. They were briefly in 2003 when the United States and the United Kingdom invaded, in, uh, invaded Iraq, Russia, Germany, and France stood together in opposition. But the Bible says you watch, that's going to happen. Number eight, some Arab nations who are natural, naturally hostile to Israel will ally with her. And again, in Ezekiel 38, it says you watch Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, UAE, Bahrain, Oman, they will become friendly with Israel. You would never have thought that would happen. Normally the Arabs hate the Jews. But the Bible says you watch, it's going to happen. And we're seeing that happen today. Number nine is quite sobering. Second Peter 3 says, either today's class or tomorrow, that at the time of the end, believers, Christadelphians, will stop believing in creation and stop believing in the flood. And will say that was all a fairy tale. Very unusual circumstance for believers to stop believing in the first five or six chapters of the Bible. But the Bible says, you watch, that's going to come to pass. And lastly, on number 10, there would be a surge in travel and widespread increase in knowledge in Daniel 12. Exactly what we're seeing today. If you have a smartphone today, you can carry with you all of the knowledge of mankind, nearly more than all the encyclopedias, more than all the libraries, you have access to everything. And Bible said, very unusual circumstance, that at the time of the end, there would be this increase in knowledge. There is no other logical or reasonable explanation for these very unusual, and you would never expect it to happen, events, other than to conclude that we are witnessing in these last days 
God is putting in place the final series of events that will lead up to Jesus' return. This is why your parents and your grandparents and your aunts and uncles talk so confidently that Jesus has got to return because they are seeing these events take place. And these events help convince them that what God said would happen in the Bible actually is coming to pass. These last six events have all happened in your lifetime. If you are 14 or 15 years old, you have seen these last six events. So that's why we say we are very, very close to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ because of this unique set of conditions. And, and God is warning us through these conditions that Jesus is about to return. All right, so that's the, uh, that's the extent of the political Aspect. Now we're going to turn our attention to the moral implications and the, and the picture that the Bible portrays of what the moral conditions will be like at the time of the end. And it is not a pretty picture. So that comes out of 2 Timothy 3, that people will willingly be disobedient to their parents. Anyone familiar with any other aspect of latter-day conditions in society. Here's the list I put, oh sorry, go ahead. The earth will groan, that's right, because of the um, mishandling of the earth and how man will be taking advantage of it and really uh, depleting its resources, which will require when Jesus returns to, to really cleanse the earth, both morally, and he will also have to reestablish how God had created the earth at the time of creation. So here's the list I put together. Fornication and adultery will become rampant, is what the Bible says. Homosexuality will be accepted and promoted. Men and women will focus on evil intentions and inventions, and they will invent new ways to do evil. Violence and immorality will be commonplace. Marriage outside truth will occur by believers. God will be removed from society. People will be obsessed with themselves. That's what the Bible says will happen in the last generation. Right before Jesus returns, people will become obsessed with themselves. Number eight, it will be a perilous time for believers, not because of persecution, but because of perversion. Now, who can, dis who can distinguish between persecution and perversion? A simple example would be a child who mouths off to their parents or swears at their parents or does something that's disobedient to their parents. That would be a simple, perversion of per simple example of perversion. There are much more serious examples of perversion where people do things and act in a way that God had never intended. That's the perversion that the Bible says you watch for. It's going to happen in the last days. Number nine, women's physical beauty will become a snare to young men in the truth. And lastly, society will teach children to disobey their parents. So the wickedness will become so great that Jesus will return to cleanse the earth and destroy the evil. That's what ends up happening. It is so terrible that when Jesus returns, one of the things he will, have, he will have to do is not only heal the earth, but he will also have to cleanse the earth from the immorality that is present at the time. So we're going to go through a series of uh, five or six verses now, and uh, we'll run it between today and tomorrow. I would recommend that you keep a list of these prophecies, either at the front of your Bible or the back of your Bible. These prophecies God had written in the Bible for you, for your generation. And, and this is to remind you, this is to teach you that this is what life will be like in the last days at the, uh, at the time of the end. The first one is in uh, Luke 17, so let's all look there if we would. Verses 26 to 27. It will be like the days of Noah, but how do you know this is talking about Jesus returning? The days of the Son of Man, when he is coming. So the day of the Son of Man in Scripture is when the Son of Man returns to the earth. 
So what were the days like back in the days of Noah? And for that, we have to go back to Genesis 6. And as we read through these, don't read these in terms of how they impacted the people in the world. Read these in terms of how they impacted the young people in the truth. Because Noah was not the only one in the truth when he was born into the world. His father, Lamech, was a faithful believer. And no doubt Lamech had brothers and sisters. And Lamech's father was Methuselah. And he was a faithful believer. So he had brothers and sisters. There should have been hundreds, if not thousands, of believers in the days of Noah. But in the end, there were only eight people who were saved because they had all lost their way. Not Lamech and Methuselah, they've now, they've now died. In fact, Methuselah dies in the year of the flood. But all the rest had lost their way. And this is why they lost their way. In verse 2, who are the sons of God who saw the daughters of men that they were fair and then took them wives of which of all which they chose. So who were the sons of God? Yes. It's a little more specific than Adam's descendants. The sons of God in verse 2. See, there's two kinds of people. There's the sons of God and there's the daughters of men. So who do you think the sons of God were? They are the young men in the truth. That's why they're called the sons of God. They were born into the truth or they were taught the truth by their parents. What about the daughters of men? Were they in the truth? No, they're not in the truth. These are women of the world. These are young girls in society. So they didn't know the truth. So you have the young men in the truth, the sons of God, and the young ladies who are not in the truth, the daughters of men. And why did the young men in the truth marry the young women out of the truth? I need a fella for this one. Thank you very much. Why did the young men in the truth marry the young ladies out of the truth? They were, say it again, they were more attractive. They were prettier. The world would say they were hotter. That's not a term the Bible uses. God values the quiet inner spirit of a woman who's devoted to him. That's not what the world values. So these women who know nothing about God but are extremely beautiful, they capture the attention of the young men in the truth. And what is the result of that attraction? They stop following the Bible, but what happens to that relationship in these verses? Somebody other than Jonathan. What happens to this relationship? You're, do you're doing a great job, Jonathan, so I don't want to discourage you. I appreciate your participation. How about somebody in the back row over here? What happens to that relationship when the young men of the truth saw these young ladies outside the truth? What was the result of that relationship, according to these verses? They bear children. So they got married. These young men in the truth saw these good-looking ladies outside the truth. They end up getting married, and they bear children. And what kind of children did they bear? Children who grew up in the truth, or children who grew up and became very successful outside the truth. Men of renown, mighty men, men who excelled in the things of the world. 
because when they had little children in their families, these little children didn't grow up to become sons and daughters of God. They grew up to become sons and daughters of the world. What kind of society existed in those days? What were the two prevailing conditions in society according to these verses? Back row, what was one of the prevailing conditions? Wickedness. And what was the other one? Whoops. Every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. So you have wickedness or evil on the one side, and on the other side you have all of these good-looking women in the world who are capturing the hearts of the young men in the truth and leading the young men in the truth astray. So you put those pieces together. If a person is very popular, this is their children now, these men of renown, if they are very popular and very successful in a very wicked world, what does that tell you about their children? They're men of renown, they're very popular, and they're very successful in a very wicked world. It shows that their children were no longer God-fearing. They're no longer living for the kingdom. So you can see in verses 11 and 12 and 13, the two overriding characteristics was violence and corruption. And that word corruption has to do with sexual immorality. That's why in Genesis 6, when it says the wickedness was great, the earth was corrupt, if you go to, over to Genesis 38, you find out that's the same word used to describe sexual immorality that happened in the life of Judah and the life of his sons. Such was the, the wickedness that was taking place. So sometimes the Bible couches or hides principles behind words because when the men who translated the Bible back in the 1600s, they didn't want to say as explicitly as what the word actually means. So they stick in the word wickedness of the world, of the earth was corrupt. It was great and the earth was corrupt. What they could have said was the earth was full of sexual immorality because that's what the world means. And that's what was being uh, promoted. But the core issue here was the phys physical attraction of the young men towards the young women. So the question then becomes who tends to enjoy violence more? Young men? or young women in this world that we live in today? Go ahead, Jonathan. Does Hollywood know that? Absolutely they know that. That's why when they're going to make a movie to target a young men's audience, what two things are they going to have in that movie? They're going to have good-looking women as they call them, as the world standards, and they're going to have violence. Something's going to get blown up. Something's going to get torn apart. There's going to be blood and guts all over the screen because Hollywood understands that's what young men like. And the people who make video games, are they aware of this? Absolutely. So what do you find in video games? The exact same aspects. It's not accidental. It's not godly and it's not right, but they are playing upon the weaknesses of young men. And in so doing, they're, uh, they're exploiting them or taking advantage of them. So in summary, society was overrun by wickedness and violence. New ways to enjoy evil were invented. Marriage out of the truth skyrocketed as the young men of the truth were attracted to the pretty women of the world. And young men in the truth became men of renown, very popular and successful in a very corrupt and violent world. And there's a couple of lessons. Why are we looking at Noah again? Why are we spending so much time looking at Noah's day? Anybody remember? David? That's exactly correct. So Jesus is telling us He's telling Savannah, he's telling Kate, he's telling 
Abby, is it? Abby. And everyone else in the room, look for these same conditions at the time of the end. So the impact on the household of faith in that day was young brethren pursued worldly women and fame, and they were lost. Two sobering lessons, young ladies, young ladies especially, take note and be warned. Be very, very careful and very selective in whom you find attractive. Even among young men in the truth, because just because someone is a, in a Christadelphian home does not mean that he is insulated from how the world is behaving. Does this young man enjoy violence? Does he like to talk to you about the violent video game he plays? Or the violent pictures he saw? Or the violent things that he appreciates when he goes to the movies? And is he obsessed with good-looking women? Be warned, be careful, be selective. That is not the kind of young man you want to connect yourself with in a relationship. What it means is that young man has been overcome by the conditions of society, just like Jesus said was going to be the case. The wickedness of Noah's world became so great that God in the end decided that he would have to wipe out all forms of life. Take a look at uh, Matthew 24. If we could have, let me find the microphone. It's still over here. Tell you what, you are, you are Jacob. Sorry, Jacob, I should have known your name. If you wouldn't mind reading for us, Matthew 24, verse 39. And listen for how the people of Noah's day responded to what they saw. Nice and loud, if you would. And knew not until the flood came and took them all, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So, he's talking about Jesus is here, the people living in Noah's day, that they knew not. Had Noah preached to them that a flood is coming? Yeah. Possibly for 120 years while he was building the ark. Did they listen? No, they knew not until the flood came, because they weren't interested. It isn't that Noah didn't appeal to them and didn't try to, to warn them what was coming, but they were swept away because they were, uh, they were so caught up in the pleasures of their day. They were oblivious to Noah's warning. The next one is in uh, Luke 17. It's the days of Lot, because remember Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Verse 28, likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So how do we know this is talking about the return of Christ? I need four people. I have one. How do we know this is talking about the return of Christ? See, this is another one of those verses that you want to write either in the beginning or the back of your Bible because it's talking about your day. What phrase in those three verses tells us this is a prophecy about Jesus' return? We have a second. We have a third. I need one more. We have a fourth. Okay, Alana, what is the phrase? Sorry? That's right, the Son of Man is revealed in verse 30. So this is a prophecy for you. And Jesus says, just like in the days of Noah, so also in the days of Lot. What were the days of Lot like? What were the days of Lot like? Sorry? Evil, wickedness, what else? Did you say homosexuality? Sorry. Homosexuality. In fact, we still use the word today, a sodomite. And that phrase, that word was coined because of the intense wickedness that occurred in the days of Abraham. And God sent an angel to Abraham and said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of the intense wickedness. 
And that lesson stayed with mankind for generations, for centuries, for millennium. But as we looked at earlier, the Bible said, you watch in the last days, the fear of God and the fear of that lifestyle will disappear. So the cities were given to sexual perversion. As you notice, in both verses, it's talking about the small and the great, or the young and the old. They were teaching the perversion of sodomy to the children. That's how wicked it had become in the days of Sodom. And that is why God had to wipe out the city. So it wasn't just something that the adults were doing. They were also teaching that perversion to the, uh, to the children. Now, Jesus doesn't go through and explain all of the things going on in Sodom and Gomorrah in Luke 17. He's assuming we're familiar with that story in Genesis uh, chapter 19. But what had happened, you see, is their conscience had been turned off. And that is the overriding aspect of the days of Noah and Lot. God has given us a conscience to help control how we live. But when that conscience is turned off, there is no end of the kind of sin that can be committed in a person's life. That conscience, as we'll see in tomorrow's class, is a defense mechanism. But once that conscience is turned off, and it was turned off in the, in the time of Lot. And remember, Jesus is warning us, he's warning you. Byron, there are influences in the world that are going to try to turn your conscience off. Lindsay, there are influences that are going to try to turn your conscience off. So that if, it can, if they can turn your conscience off, then there's all kinds of sin that you can be encouraged to pursue. And that's why Jesus warns us, watch out for those days. So the warning of Jesus is that all the evil of Noah's day and all the evil of Lot's day would converge in a single generation. Expect to see an explosion of evil in your lifetime. You are seeing evil in your lifetime that I didn't see in my lifetime. If you wanted to learn about some of the evil that was available back then, you had to find stores at the end of a road. You had to dig deep into libraries. Not anymore. All of that evil can now be carried with you on your smartphone. And Jesus warned us, beware of what's coming. Expect a moral challenge to your faith. Don't be caught unprepared. So it's not true to say the world has always been evil. It has been, but now in this last generation, the picture that Scripture portrays is that there would be more evil in this last generation than we have, uh, we have ever seen in the past. Now the last one we're going to look at. So, as a result, don't be surprised if some of your CYC friends end up leaving the truth in the next five years. Tragedy? Yes. Do we encourage that? No. But the Bible is warning us that in the last days, these attractions, these influence, this wickedness, is going to come, and only those who are aware of it and are willing to stand up against it are going to be able to survive these days. We don't put this warning on the screen to encourage any of you to leave the truth, but we put this warning on the screen as a warning of what the Scripture says. In Noah's day, there were many that were lost, because those young girls were just too pretty and attractive. And they were lost because that, that interest in violence and corruption was just too great. So it's critical, young people, that we maintain and develop a defense against these evil influences. If we just go along with them, we will be carried away. Some young ladies will decide to pursue a boyfriend who is not in the truth, and he will take her heart away from God. And some young men will also be led away by attractive young women outside the truth, along with the world's ungodly attractions and pleasures. So that's the, that's the warning, that's the danger that Scripture portrays. And what we'll uh, do for the 
uh, tomorrow's class and then the subsequent ones is look a bit more at the picture portrayed because there's three or four more references in the New Testament before turning our attention to then what can we do to protect ourselves, to make sure we're not one of those who are caught away. But it's a very, very dangerous time, and all Jesus could do is warn us. And as we'll see, Jesus warns us, Paul warns us, John warns us, they all want, Peter warns us, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, and they don't all use the phrase, in the last days, but they use a phrase that is clearly telling us, in the last generation, in Hannah's generation, in Amber's generation, in Savannah's generation, this is what we're going to have to face. 